I made a video not too long ago entitled Calling Out False Prophets and Teachers by Name, where I exposed some supposed prophets, such as Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, Charles Taze Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I also exposed some modern false teachers like Alan Parr, Ray Comfort, and DLM Christian Life. Some of you in the comments asked me how come I didn't include Alan White in my list of false prophets. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video. I am going to be addressing four supposed false prophecies of Ellen White, which are blasted across numerous websites and videos criticizing Ellen White and accusing her of being a false prophet. But before I do that, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the bell if you're new. I'm no prophet, but I predict that you will not regret it. Also, some of you have been telling me that you have not been receiving notifications of my uploads. So make sure to click on the drop down arrow next to the subscribe button and click all to fix that. Now let's get into Ellen White's false prophecies. Number one, Jerusalem would never be rebuilt. In 1851, Ellen White wrote, then I was pointed to some who are in a great error of believing that it is their duty to go to old Jerusalem and think they have a work to do there before the Lord comes. Such a view is calculated to take the mind and interest from the present work of the Lord. Under the message of the third angel, for those who think that they are yet to go to Jerusalem will have their minds there and their means will be withheld from the cause of present truth to get themselves and others there. I saw that such a mission would accomplish no real good that it would take a long while to make a very few of the Jews believe, even in the first advent of Christ. Much more to believe in his second advent. I saw that Satan had greatly deceived some in this thing and that souls all around them in this land could be helped by them and led to keep the commandments of God. But they were leaving them to perish. I also saw that old Jerusalem never would be built up and that Satan was doing his utmost to lead the minds of the children of the Lord into these things now, in the gathering time, to keep them from throwing their whole interest into the present work of the Lord, and to cause them to neglect the necessary preparation for the day of the Lord. Critics claim that this is a false prophecy because Jerusalem has been built up and is occupied by many Jews today. But you have to understand that Ellen White was not talking about the political occupation of Jerusalem by the Jews when she made this prediction. She was talking about a prophecy that some Millerites believed needed to be fulfilled. According to an online post entitled Jerusalem Never to be Rebuilt by WhiteEstate.org, Many former Millerites were setting various dates for the return of Jesus, with 1850 and 1851 being the latest dates for the end of the 2300-day year prophecy. They believed the second advent would usher in the millennial kingdom on earth, during which time the world would be converted under the reign of Christ, with the Jews playing a leading role. And the literal Jews would welcome their Messiah, Christ, in Palestine, thus fulfilling Old Testament prophecies with Jerusalem becoming Christ's capital during the millennium. Ellen White claiming that Jerusalem would never be built up has to be understood within this context. She was saying that this prophecy would not be fulfilled, that Jesus would not return in 1851 to establish a millennial kingdom in Jerusalem and would be welcomed by the Jews. And believers should not focus their attention in trying to convert the Jews because it would be futile and distract them from the mission that God gave them in their own land. Number two, England would attack the United States. Another supposed false prophecy of Ellen White is that England would attack the United States during the Civil War. In 1855, Ellen White wrote, when England does declare war, all nations will have an interest of their own to serve, and there will be general war, general confusion. Of course, history tells us that England never declared war against the United States, so does that make Ellen White a false prophet? No, because that's not what she actually said. If you read the entire quote, it's evident that she was speaking hypothetically. 
In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 259, she wrote, England is studying whether it is best to take advantage of the present weak condition of our nation and venture to make war upon her. She is weighing the matter and trying to sound other nations. She fears if she should commence war abroad that she would be weak at home and that other nations would take advantage of her weakness. Other nations are making quiet yet active preparations for war and are hoping that England will make war with our nation, for then they would improve the opportunity to be revenged on her for the advantage she has taken of them in the past and the injustice done them. A portion of the Queen's subjects are waiting a favorable opportunity to break their yoke. But if England thinks it will pay, she will not hesitate a moment to improve her opportunities to exercise her power and humble our nation. When England does declare war, all nations will have an interest of their own to serve and there will be general war, general confusion. Notice the hypothetical characteristics of these statements. She fears if she should commence war abroad that she would be weak at home and but if England thinks it will pay. It's obvious that Ellen White was speaking hypothetically here. Then follows the sentence, when England does declare war. You know, the word when can be used in a hypothetical sense as well because the words when and if are interchangeable. Google explains, when and if are easily confused. Sometimes they are interchangeable but very often they have different meanings. Both words can talk about repeated actions and both can express a condition. Considering the hypothetical nature of Ellen White's other statements about England declaring war against the United States, it only makes sense that she was using the word win in a hypothetical sense as well. And that's why it's important to read the context of Ellen White's quotes. I've noticed oftentimes when people criticize Ellen White, they quote her out of context and try to make her say something that she didn't actually say to discredit her. Number three, Jesus would return in her lifetime. Another accusation made against Ellen White is that she predicted the seven last plagues would be poured out on some people in her day and Jesus would return, which is actually true. In 1856, Ellen White wrote, I was shown the company present at the conference, said the angel, some food for worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues. Some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. What is the explanation of this seemingly false prophecy? Ellen White explained in 1883, The angels of God in their messages to men present time as very short. Thus it has always been presented to me. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of this message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. Ellen White reveals an important biblical principle here. God's promises are conditional. In other words, Jesus didn't return when Ellen White expected because the conditions of his return were not met. This reminds me of the prophet Jonah. In Jonah chapter 3, God commanded that the prophet Jonah would go to Nineveh and proclaim that in 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed. Verses 2 through 4 state, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But what happened to Nineveh? Was it overthrown? No, quite the opposite. The people of Nineveh believed God's message and proclaimed a fast. And verse 10 tells us, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So God told Jonah to go and proclaim destruction on Nineveh. He did it and then God changed his mind because the conditions had changed. By all outward appearances, that would make Jonah a false prophet because he predicted something that didn't happen. 
But he's not a false prophet because God's promises and threatenings are conditional and the conditions of Nineveh changed. For example, the Lord said in Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 7 through 10, The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Do you think the same rule applies to the second coming of Jesus? That certain conditions need to be met or else it will take longer for Jesus to return? Absolutely. The Bible indicates that we need to prepare spiritually for Jesus' second coming and preach the gospel to hasten his return. For example, 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 states, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. This tells us that we need to live holy, godly lives to prepare and hasten the return of the Lord. In addition, Matthew chapter 24 verse 14 states, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So how do you think the second coming of Jesus would be affected if his people neglected their spiritual preparation and mission to preach the gospel to the world? It would hinder his return, right? And that's exactly what happened. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 68, Ellen White wrote, But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, she's talking about the Great Disappointment of 1844, Many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen, the few who, following in the providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding warning to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth and in turn the labor of its advocates was necessarily spent in answering these opponents and defending the truth. Thus, the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. So instead of purity and unity of faith, doubt and division led to strife which hindered the preaching of the gospel, and the return of Jesus. Also, did you know that the Bible indicates the return of Jesus would be delayed? This is illustrated in the parable of the faithful and evil servant in Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51, stating, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. The master who is to return symbolizes Jesus at his second coming. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did you catch that? The wicked servant said, my master is delaying his coming, which indicates that Jesus will return at a time later than expected. Ellen White expected the return of Jesus in her day, but that time has been delayed due to the actions of God's people who were divided and hindered from preaching the gospel like they should have. Number four, Christ would return before slavery was abolished. In 1849, Ellen White had a vision explaining, 
I saw the pious slave rise in triumph and victory and shake off the chains that bound him, while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not what to do. For the wicked could not understand the words of the voice of God. Soon appeared the great white cloud upon which sat the Son of Man. The problem is slavery was abolished in the United States in 1865, just 16 years after this vision. So was Ellen White wrong? If Ellen White was wrong, then the Bible is wrong. Because the Bible indicates that there will be slavery at the second coming of Jesus. Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 through 17 states, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? When Ellen White said slavery would exist at the second coming of Jesus, she wasn't saying anything contradictory to the Bible. Yes, slavery has been abolished in the United States for now, but Bible prophecy tells us that's going to change. In 1895, decades after the Emancipation of Proclamation, Ellen White wrote, Slavery will again be revived in the southern states, for the spirit of slavery still lives. The type of slavery that Ellen White was talking about was not black slavery, but slavery as a form of punishment for those who would reject the mark of the beast. In the book The Great Controversy, page 608, Ellen White wrote, As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, some will be treated as slaves. These four supposed false prophecies are just a fraction of the criticism that you could find about Ellen White online. But as you see, there's two sides to every story. There are logical, reasonable explanations for the supposed false prophecies and other criticisms of Ellen White. And this is actually one of the reasons I decided to become a Seventh-day Adventist. I was going to a Sunday keeping church before I became a Seventh-day Adventist and sharing some of the things I was learning from Adventist literature with other people who were going to the same service. And some of those people told me all kinds of bizarre things and false prophecies that Ellen White supposedly said, but when I researched them for myself, I discovered that that wasn't true at all. Ellen White was a prolific author who wrote about 155 books, which Adventists consider to be inspired by God. Now, of course, her writings are not on the same level as the Bible, but Adventists believe that since she had the gift of prophecy, she wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I agree, especially after reading many of her books for myself. I'm glad that I read them, and I encourage you to read them as well to see what she wrote for yourself and to gain more insights into the scriptures. A good place to start is the Conflict of the Ages series, which is an insightful commentary about the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Click on the link in the video description to order your own set today. Not only do I highly recommend these books, but this is also an affiliate link, which means that I earn a small commission from your purchase, which helps keep my channel going. The Bible includes several warnings about false prophets and teachers, saying that many will be misled by their destructive heresies and deceptions. It is imperative to be able to identify false prophets and teachers so you are not misled by them and lost. You can do that by clicking on the screen and watching my video entitled, Calling Out False Prophets and Teachers by Name. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it to help spread God's word. Thank you for watching and God bless you.